Welcome back. And today we have an interesting mix for you. I'm going to start by saying just a little bit about my book. Then I'm going to answer questions and then we're going to uh, really mop up from the last session. Um, we The course book for the next series is this one. It is The Art of Dying uh, by myself and my wife. It's a very good book, I think, but of course I would or I wouldn't have written it. It um, uh, contains many, many, many experiences of the dying and if you do get it, when we go into death, which is going to be our next subject after near-death experiences, you will see that uh, death is not a simple thing and I'm going to, at the end, make the astonishing claim that death may be an expansion and not a contraction of consciousness. How on earth can I say that? Well, that's what the scientific data seems to point to. So anyway, if you're going to, going to be interested in death, I'd recommend that book as it contains many examples of the things we'll talk about. Now, the other book is Shining Light on Transcendence, which is my own personal journey with a man who can give light and in the process of giving light, he's meditating when he's giving light, he can also uh, change your conscious level. I think that's an interesting book. It's out in paperback and I think hardback as well. So let's then uh, start with the questions. Uh, I'm going to ask Maddock, or the lion, if he will very kindly read them. And you remember that the lion is my grandson. Yeah. Okay. So this one is by Dave. Okay. Um, it's also a bit about the book. He says, Peter, I've purchased and read much of your newest book. I do hope you will de devote future videos to your experience with Alan Forte and transcend your experiences with his approach. Also, he must have Casper back. Yes. yes. I'm so sorry. Uh, we called we Casper <laughs> and he, he wasn't here, Dave. <laughs> he will come back when it's supper time. <laughs> yes, he will. So it may be no Casper this session, but we'll see. Um, Thank you for that. Yes, I certainly will. I think my plan at the moment is to do death after after this session. We'll start with that because many of you will have a chance to get our book and look at it. And then after that, I think probably shining light on transcendence would be the thing to do. Maybe instead of Casper, we could... <laughs> yes, <laughs> Dave, <laughs> will that do? We, uh, there's a sad story attached to this little fellow. Um, we had a cat oh. and he became very ill and died. And one of our grandchildren, who's actually in Japan, sent, sent us this as a replacement. So while Casper's away, I'll say, hi, Dave. <laughs> okay. Okay. Here's one. Okay. Uh, do you approve of organ donation from people who are brain dead? Is there a possibility of one coming back to life? That is a very important and insightful question because we're all now going to have to opt out of giving our organs, so you've got to make a decision to opt out rather than as it used to be to opt in to have your organs given. So one wants to be absolutely certain that there's no chance of you coming back. And so this really is not a chance to talk about the sort of final process from the physical side of death. I'll give you, when we do death, we'll do it from the mental side. This is the physical side. Now remember, uh, if you're going to donate your organs, the people who do the work uh, in 
harvesting it, if you like, um, don't want you all cold and horrid. So it's usually done on people who are brain dead in intensive care and then uh, there is no hope of them surviving because they take away the artificial respiration and uh, then the heart stops and then after that after they've been certified as brain dead they will go into the process of having their organs removed now this would have been a very straight story uh, except there was a man called Chowler and he's in the States and he noted in rats not humans in rats that uh, after they their heart has stopped and they are in fact brain dead you get a pulse of brain activity and Chowler raised the question whether this pulse of brain activity was the, ne the near-death experience I, I don't think it is the near-death experience but nevertheless it, it's uh, out there in the literature so then there were other workers who put uh, EEG machines electrical activity of the brain and only in the frontal frontal region here to show that as people came down to death uh, their activity decreased and again once they had been if you like brain dead for about as long even as 10 minutes then uh, they could um, uh, they they could get this huge pulse of organized semi-organized I don't know how organized semi-organized activity which raises the question as whether consciousness can return to the brain I think the usual the accepted view now is that it's just random neuronal firing and not suitable for consciousness but another study has been done in which they went to a slaughterhouse and took pigs heads after they'd been cut off rushed them to the laboratory coupled up their main uh, vessels to an artificial nutrient in which also carried oxygen to the pig's brain and this showed uh, that you could get really quite good organized activity in the brain of the pig after a, a considerable time so uh, the extension of death um, is now beyond just uh, the stopping of the heart and the stopping of respiration it, you have to think of it as going on after that but there is really no evidence that these examples are show any form of consciousness so I think that if you get one of these pulses and they're going to take out uh, your kidney or something in other words you've been certified as brain dead then I think that you're going to be okay the latest uh, fMRI that is uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging that's uh, how you can get uh, pictures of the brain metabolic pictures of the brain and it shows that when you are brain dead there is in fact no metabolic activity going on the brain is in fact really unconscious so should one opt in or opt out I think probably uh, uh, it, you should opt uh, you should leave it and not opt out because if you have a relative who needs a kidney and you're really badly damaged so that you are in essence brain dead to let somebody else have your kidney I think is a true act of love so uh, I think that is really the view I take mm -hmm. Of course, I've almost got to the point now where nobody's going to want my organs because they're so old. But it, when I was younger, then that's the view I would take. It would be a good line for like a horror, a horror movie. For, for a, a horror movie. Oh, it, it certainly would. Somebody like gave themselves. Yeah.
Okay. Now we have a bit of an example. So, I had a so-called NDE back in February 2012, two months after losing a loved one. A Friday night, my cousin also had the same or similar visitation by the same person the exact same night as me. But after the message from the loved one, I saw what can only be described as God, which was in a black void. It was amazing, beyond words. It was not a dream, I know the difference very well. And not only that, we also experienced odd things happening in the house. For example, the TV turning on with max volume at night, coat hangers spinning, lights flickering, and knocking on windows. Okay, that's really a very nicely described experience. The visitation um, by somebody who's recently died is probably uh, the, a type of deathbed coincidence. We'll go into deathbed coincidences when we do death because they're part of the phenomena. They usually occur at the time of death, but they can in fact occur after death. Uh, they, the person who comes to visit you uh, always has a message for you. We're not told what the message is, but uh, I assume it would be saying that they're okay, don't worry. It's the usual one. And the uh, fact that the... Uh, do I hear Casper? Hello. <laughs> it looks as if Casper's going to come after all. Come on, Casper. Um, and the fact that um, they uh, that they saw them shows that there is an emotional bond between the person and the. Oh, Casper! What are you doing? You were oh. meant to be here much earlier. And don't stand on the computer, Casper. <laughs> there you are, Casper causing a bit of chaos. Um, and uh, so they usually come if there's an emotional connection. Now, what really interested me were the other phenomena. You see, I can understand that one as being part, in fact, of the death process, and we'll go into this when, when we get get to that time. The other thing is light street lamps going out, um, coat hangers spinning, all those sorts of things are not uncommon, and uh, I, I actually mean that, in people who have near-death experiences after they've had the experience. And uh, you remember I was saying that I thought that some people with near-death experiences changed their level of consciousness, and it's those people that have these phenomena. So when we talk about death, we're going to come almost to that again, but there's another question on that. So yes, a, a really interesting experience, and uh, I absolutely believe that you weren't drunk, as you said <laughs> in the question. Um, yes, fascinating. Because mm, you, you can see like clips of those happening on YouTube, where I think some guy who had a house which he thought was um, not it's not related to NDEs, but he thought was kind of had ghosts in it. And he put a CCTV camera up in his kitchen, and he went out for an hour, and he and he filmed everything. And you know the lights were flickering, doors were opening and starting, yeah. things were basically like flying around the place. Uh, that's an in interesting. Yeah. Uh, because it's uh, very much like a lot of the accounts of poltergeists yeah. and poltergeist happenings. Okay, next one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bannock, for continuing to post this fascinating content. You're welcome. <laughs> it, it's remarkable just how many independent sources are saying extremely similar things. I would be very interested to know your views on the best way to increase consciousness. Okay, um, that is a totally fascinating question. How can one increase one's conscious level to get a much better understanding of what the world is and how it's constructed? Uh, well, of course there have been for many I would say thousands of years various systems for doing this 
you could become a Buddhist, use Buddhist meditation. i just come back from a conference where there was in fact uh, a number of scientific papers on the effects of Bud Buddhist meditation on the brain and no doubt at all now that the meditation affects the way the brain works, uh, the various parameters, it helps your concentration, attention, etc. So that's a spin-off from it, but what you really want to do is to uh, increase your level of consciousness to the point that you will flip into non-duality, and I'll say a little bit more about non-duality in a moment. So you could follow the Zen path, the Buddhist path, the Christian mystical path, if you like, they're all paths, or you can follow a new path. If you could pass me that book, yeah, that's the one. Um, I think I've shown you this one before. Um, it's The Finders by Jeffrey Martin. He's a researcher in, uh, in California, and he's done a, a lot of work on courses of um, uh, ways in which you can learn to change your level of consciousness. Uh, the problem with Jeffrey's courses are not that they're not extremely good. He gives figures of nearly 70% of people who gives figures of nearly 70% of people who have uh, transited or become non-dual and he's got a whole scheme of it and so on, but you can read about that in the book. But the interesting thing is uh, there are now the beginnings of courses that you can attend, but always be careful with your courses that they're right for you, and uh, always examine the people who are going to be teaching you, because you don't really want to go to a course which is rubbish. Uh, Jeffrey says he gets 70%, as I said, of people transiting. That's a very, very, very high number when you think that people go to Zen monasteries for many years and don't. Uh, I think the other point is that he charges $2,000. Wow, which of us have got $2,000 to spend on something we're not sure is going to work for us? Not many of us. but. When I taxed him on this and said, you know, why do you charge so much? He says, if I don't, people won't do the course. Because it's uh, in the course, he would like you, first of all, to do an hour's meditation a day, and then two hours meditation a day of different forms and kinds. So, uh, yes, you can. Uh, and there are standard ways of doing it. But if you're lucky enough, to live in the country. The Japanese tree bathing is quite a nice way of certainly cal calming the mind and moving in the direction of expanded consciousness. Tree bathing means you walk through the woods, uh, these lovely woods with tall trees. Here's another question. Yeah, before we get on to that, I have a little inquiry because you've heard about, you know, certain people, when they die, they decide to be frozen oh, in yes. the big tubes, in the hope that in 200 years' time, they'd have the technology to unfreeze themselves and still be living and be brought back to life or something. Do you think that could be possible? Yeah, uh, I'm sure it will be possible to a certain extent because if you can take the DNA of dinosaurs and start the process of reconstructing a dinosaur, then um, you probably will be able to take the DNA from the brain. But remember that we actually don't know where memory is encoded and how it's encoded. So to try and get yourself back again to that state I think would be really difficult. Am I going to use uh, my money to buy a frozen, uh, a place for a frozen head of mine? No, I don't think so. And when we do death, then we'll uh, see really why I don't think it's an option for me, although of course if 
if you guys want to do it, you're welcome to, but don't expect anything. I think it'd be, if it did work, I think it'd be quite traumatic, because, you know, you're being dead, and then 500 years later, you're suddenly alive again, and the world's completely changed. Yes, I and think... And it would be completely overwhelming. That's an excellent point. And then what do you do? Because you don't really, you know, jobs will be different. And for the jobs, it probably need higher skill sets, yeah. which you don't have. No, I agree so, with all that. So a lot of disadvantages, very few advantages. Well, there is one advantage, and that is for the people who offer the service. They get a lot of money. Okay, any more questions? Um, yeah, so this one says, hope reincarnation is not true, because that means this place is just a trap for the ego. Why would we keep reincarnating? Not like this is a nice place for six billion people live in horrible conditions, not to mention the 500 billion animals we eat every year. What a good question. And it really is uh, a combination of ethics and how we view the world. Now I'm going to talk to you about existential fear of death. Some of you can put that into Google and see what existential fear is, because this, in fact, um, really controls a, a lot of our thinking and behaviour. So the important point is the reincarnation. Uh, how can we tell? There is a, a man called uh, Stevenson, and he was working in the University of Virginia and he studied reincarnation. If any of you are interested in his scientific evidence, he's published 2,000 cases of reincarnation. So you can get hold of his book, he's, which is a huge book, of course. He's got a slightly smaller one for the, um, uh, for the general public, which is not quite so technical. And Stevenson has now, now died and his place, place has been taken in the University of Virginia by Jim Tucker. And um, most of Stevenson's cases were Indian. And so there was a lot of discussion in the literature as to whether in fact he was just um, being conned by people in India to get money from him. I don't think that's true because I think his evidence is very good, but you must look at it and judge for yourself. Uh, Jim Tucker has found American cases, and uh, these are, are much easier for us to understand because they are in fact uh, within our own culture. So uh, again, uh, name into Google and have a look at, at some of some of his cases. So that's Jim Tucker, Virginia University, on reincarnation. Yeah, I think that's that's it. Okay. So thank so, you for the comments. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, thanks very much for uh, all the comments that you've made. They're enormously helpful and very exciting. And I hope that you like the broadcasts. Um, I think the, uh, the one on death is uh, going to be a very important one in many ways because we're all going to die. Now, any of you out there not going to die? If you are, see me after the show. <laughs> because it's a very common experience. We all have relatives who have died and even um, uh, we have animals who we love dearly, like Casper, who will die, so we have to face that. And then there was the ethical question we've talked about. All those people, all those um, animals that, that we eat and die. So uh, lots of importance to death and what follows up from that. So. That's the end yeah. of this session. So subscribe, like, comment. Um, if you have any inquiries, you know, comment. And um, buy the new book, because it's good, I think. <laughs> <laughs> what about that? It's validation from one's techie. Yes. That's a really good thing. So thank you all very much for watching. 
and we hope to be back in a week or so's time.